All right, I'm gonna call the zoning board meeting for uh, July 28th, 2020 to order. We have five members of the board tonight and the board members that are with us is member Steve Bernard, Chief Michael Williams, Doris Smith is our alternate who is filling in for this evening, Steve Lianus, and Kenneth Galligan, myself, I am the chairman. Our zoning enforcement officer is Jim Pluff, who is also the building inspector, and our recording secretary is Beth Lacombe. Okay. I would ask before the meeting starts, if you have a cell phone, just put it on silent or shut it off. It becomes very yep. distracting if it rings. Yep. So prior to the start of the hearing, uh, do you want to withdraw or do you want ready to go forward? Ready to go forward. Okay, very good. The way we're going to handle the meeting is I will ask you to do your presentation. When you have finished your presentation, I will then ask any of the board members if they have any questions about your statements that you made. When that is completed, I will ask for anyone who wants to speak in favor. After that, I will ask for anyone who is in opposition. That can either be in person or it can be by letter or email. Then I will ask if there's any elected officials that want to comment on the petition. When that is done, I will close that portion of the hearing and then I will open it up to the board for deliberations. So what will happen is the board will discuss the case and after our deliberations have been completed, a board member will make a motion uh, to grant and then we will take a vote. So tonight in order for something to pass, there has to be four affirmative votes. Okay. So a five person board, we can have one dissenting vote, but we have to have four that are in favor. It's, if it's a three to two vote, it does not pass. Okay. Okay, everybody good? Yes. Okay, before I start with the actual hearing, I need to read a document that has come from the governor relative to what we're doing tonight. In accordance with the governor's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A section 20, relating to the 2020 novel coronavirus outbreak emergency. The meeting tonight, the public meeting tonight of the Zoning Board of Appeals will be open to the public. However, the public and all applicants are encouraged to participate remotely. Okay, the first case before the board tonight is 20-41, petition of John and Muriel Grabowski, 669 North Cary Street, Brockton, Mass, for a special permit for a dog kennel license for six dogs at the two-family home in an R1C zone located at 669 North Cary Street. So if you want to speak, just identify yourself and then state your case. Okay, um, so my name is Melissa Garner, and I'm actually their daughter, the Grabowski's daughter, and I reside here. Um, I have uh, three dogs of my own, and my best friend who ha lives right around the corner, who's also um, the Holbrook Animal Control Officer, she is residing with her brother currently, so she keeps three of her dogs here. So... This is where we're, we're hobby breeders. We each have one, maybe two litters a year. And we would just like to be able to have the six dogs um, under the kennel license so that we can just keep them all that way. That's about all that I have. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh just a question now. All the yep. documents that we have been provided mm -hmm. relative to this location and, and very specifically documents that have come from the dog office here in Brockton, it appears as though what's been happening at this location is that 
dogs have been sold from this location. Is that true? Well, we do. Yes, breed. We're, we're hobby breeders. Right. So we're not, okay. we're not a giant kennel. Yeah, we we have a couple of our own dogs, which is okay. each each not against has, the law. Right. Technically. Each one of us has a couple of females. And we, like I said, we, I might have one or two litters a year and she might have one or two litters a year. Okay. So actually, uh, what you're doing is running a business from that location, selling and breeding dogs. So this actually is a variance okay. to allow a business to operate in that location okay. to breed dogs and to sell dogs. So I just want you to understand that what you're asking for tonight is a variance okay. Correct. to run a business in that location. Is that kind of what you're doing there? We don't look at it that way. Again, we're hobby breeders. So, but we're, it, you know, I mean, I guess if you buy and sell something on a property and it, that does constitute as a business. Um, yes, it, it does. Okay. Yeah, so fine. that we understand that. Mm -hmm. All right. So just to help you understand, if you are going to run that business and you need a variance to do that, you need to explain to the board what your hardship is there. Why is it necessary for you to actually operate what you're doing from that location? What is the hardship? Okay. It's, oh, is he back? Oh, there he is. <laughs> yep. We lost you. Okay. We good? Yep. yep. We can hear you. Now, yep. yep. Okay, so explaining about what you were, you were actually saying something about the variance and then we lost you. Okay, so in order for you to get a variance for that location, you have to explain to the board what the hardship is with that location. In other words, why couldn't you carry out this business in another location? Why does it have to be done there? Just as an example. Okay. Um, well, there are pets. I mean, these are family pets. They live in our house. They... I mean, some of the dogs have to live outside because, um, you know, right. I mean, we have plenty of room here and, and, Bonds. but some of them live in the house. And so for us to there, we wouldn't bring our pets somewhere and leave them. I mean, again, this is just, this is something, I don't know. We don't, we don't, I don't look I, at it as a business. I, so it's, I'd like to chime in, um, because this it's my field and I've been doing it for a long time. We have a five stall horse barn here. We have a couple of dogs that have full coats that if they need to stay out, we have heated dog houses inside the barn. There's over two acres and it's fenced in. So they're not living in a kennel situation like most breeders would have them. They're not, they can go out, they can run free. If I was to take my three dogs to my house where I am, instead of having them here, the lot is like 5,000 square feet and they're used to having all this area to run in and play and we have pools set up and um, it's just more convenience. Um, also because everything is already here the bonds the lights the fencing the horse fencing the land. the land all of that is already here and it's obviously not feasible to go find an empty piece of property in brockton to allow them to have the freedom that they're accustomed to and again being our pets they're they sleep on our beds some of them <laughs> so you realize you can have as many as three dogs uh, by law. Correct. Th three dogs you can have, right? Right. But uh, from right. all the information well, we have, we, we have the six. Because it is a two. It is a two, a two family. family here. So technically, but it's we legally were, three per home per per floor. But we were mm -hmm. we ran into a problem with the animal control saying that she couldn't keep her dogs here because technically that was boarding. But when it's really, we've been best friends since we were 11. She grew up here, I grew up on the street around the corner and her parents, I'm going through a divorce and rather than give up my dogs, her parents allowed me to bring my dogs here. And so it made us over in dogs. 
and this yep. is and they have, was the road. They have their shots. We have a vet that comes out to the property. Um, you know, they have fleet control. I mean, they get the best of everything, food, fresh water, two, three times a day. Um, it would be a hardship to have to get rid of the animals that we love, and that's what it will boil down to. Okay, very good. Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, I'm going to close. Oh. I can't hear him. Steve. 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 Unmute. Center of the screen. Unmute. 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 Are you, uh, how long have you been operating as a breeder in, the, in this, uh, as hobby breeders in this lo location? I just moved my dogs here in last, last March. Yeah. Last March of 2019. Yes. yes. And right. they are licensed. Okay. Are, are you uh, currently under a cease and desist order? Yes. And we, I don't have puppies right now. Okay. Uh, have you have you been inspected by the uh, animal control? Um, we haven't had a formal inspection yet, but I did have Tom DeCellis come down here um, to show him where I was moving my dogs to because I've worked uh, with him for a long time. And I said, look, I just want you to see what I'm doing and what I have. So you see how they're being kept and to make sure we weren't getting any complaints. Uh, has, has, he, has he given you the, the, the okay to operate? Well, right now, until we get an approval to have the license, it goes on, you would have to approve, then the animal control officer would come out and inspect. The and animal give control you comes after, after the year, yes. uh, with, whether or not you get the approval from, from us. Right. right, exactly. Okay. Um, so you, um, just for I, clarification, you, you have six, six dogs, not, not three, but six. Is that correct? That is correct. Correct, but in a legal two family. But an illegal two family, okay. It's illegal two family, so technically you could have three per floor. We're just trying to be upfront about it because I live the next street over and we don't want any repercussions. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a two family house. How many people live in the, in, in the house? How many human beings live in the house? Um, there is four in one unit and one in another. And she does not have, she is not allowed to have an animal. Uh, are, are there any uh, <clears throat> what uh, what are the, what are the what breeds of dogs do you have? Um, we breed golden doodles, and those are actually bred for hypoallergenic purposes for people that can't have dogs. They they're actually not allergic to them, and um, I have a German Shepherd. Okay, uh, and. Um, do you intend to uh, uh, expand the breed of dogs uh, after the life of uh, the current dogs? Um, no, no, not at this time. No, it's, it's just the ones pets. that we have. Yeah. We don't plan on bringing in any any extra. No. Right, and my last question: uh, How uh, how long do you uh, intend to uh, uh, be hobby breeders in this location? Well, I, I live here permanently, and right now she's residing a, around the so corner permanently. So it probably, we would probably be reapplying definitely next year. Um, you know, who knows where life is going to bring us. It could be to another town. It could be to another piece of property. But right now, um, we are stuck. These are our residents. Yeah. Right. So we are stuck where we are until we can afford to do anything different. All right, thank you for giving me a better understanding of what it is you're trying to do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you're you. Welcome. Any other board member? Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? I do. <laughs> do we have any uh, documents, correspondence, anything to come in in favor?
Okay, so nobody speaking in favor. Okay, I'll close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Any documents? Anybody come in for opposition? No one raising their hand. So the only documents on opposition that we have is from the dog officer on the inspections of the property. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. I'm going to close that portion. Is there any public official that wants to speak on the issue? We have one? Okay, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing and I will now open it up for deliberations from the board. Steve. Uh, Steve, uh, so uh, if if we uh, allow allow the variance, the variance goes with the with the property. That's correct. Is that correct? So that um, it's my understanding that the, a hobby kennel business can be run at this property uh, uh, on infinitum. I guess uh, is that correct? We can put a time limitation on it, but. We cannot make it mandatory that the current owner has to maintain ownership. In other words, we could put a sunset clause on this variance. Right, so, so it does go with. So it does go with the property, but we can put yes, a time, time on it. Not with the owner, correct. And and um, I didn't get a clarification of how long the how long the uh, petitioners were, <coughs> were going to be hobby hobby breeders. They didn't seem to have a long term. No, they did not. They didn't know how long they were going to be there. That's right. Any other board member? I will just express my concern that based upon all the documents that we have received from the dog officer, it's pretty apparent that a, a kennel operation has been running from this location for, for a period of time where there's been advertisements that have been put out to the public and dogs have been sold and bred from this location. Uh, it is a residential location, and uh, I'm just concerned that what has gone on at this location is much larger than just some friendly uh, dogs that are personal pets. Uh, my concern here is a kennel license that would allow such a thing to continue in the future. So that's the concerns that I have. Also, Dr. Reese, so if you want to ask her if she has any questions, she has Who has questions? If, if you might want to ask Dr. Smith, who's the other member that's on Zoom. Oh, I'm sorry. Therese, are you there? I am. I am here, Chief. Um, I'm just, I am somewhat concerned that um, this is a two-family house and the other uh, tenant cannot have animals. Um, or dogs, and this person who is living at this part of the property um, is asking us for to secure and have six dogs on the property where the other tenant was not allowed to have any, and she didn't explain why that was. Yeah, I heard that also. So honestly, I don't know how that two family plays into it. We're looking at the location. It's the site. Okay. Thank you. We've had similar uh, situations in the past. In the past two years, we've had some very similar situations. I would entertain a motion if anybody's ready for a motion. Yeah, I, I would, uh, con considering considering all, all uh, taking into consideration the concerns that the board members have, I, I um, uh, make a motion to to to, uh, to grant with the hopes that it fails. Second. All right, on the motion, uh, if this should pass, would the board be uh, amenable to uh, 
putting a stipulation on there that this variance for this location is time sensitive and shall not last more than a period of time. I, I just throw that out there. Um, it doesn't have to be there, but okay. So there's a motion made and seconded to grant. All those in favor of granting, uh, please call the roll. Mr. Bernard. Uh, deny. That would be a um, no. No. Uh, Ms. Smith. No. Mr. Lanis. No. Chief Williams. No. Chairman Galligan. No. Chairman Galligan, we have five in the negative, zero in the positive. Okay, so the vote is nobody in favor, five in opposition. Petition is denied. Petition uh, 2042, the petition of Atlantic Medicinal Partners Incorporated, 329 Washington Street, Woburn, Mass., for a special permit from Article 3, Section 27, 24.4, Subsection 3 and B, to operate a marijuana retailer in a C3 zone located at 4 Main Street. Now, before we start, does the petitioner want to continue or want to withdraw? Uh, we'll continue. Okay, very good. Just identify yourself and uh, state your case. Sure. Uh, my name is Phil Silverman. Uh, I'm here for Atlantic Medicinal Partners. I'm the attorney for the company. Uh, the company has represented uh, Steve and Jeff Perkins, are the principals of the company, and I believe they're here as well. Uh, I'll just start by quickly introducing myself. Uh, I work at the law firm Vicente Cedarburg in Boston. My law firm is the only national law firm in the country specializing in the cannabis industry. And we have affiliated offices in every state where cannabis has been legalized and we represent about 100 or more clients in Massachusetts. So we've had a little bit of experience implementing um, cannabis uh, businesses in a lot of cities and towns for the last several years. And what we try to do is make this work uh, for each particular city or town. We recognize that uh, there is no one size fits all. No two cities are alike, no two neighborhoods are alike, but we have a lot of experience working within environments that are kind of similar to the one we're talking about here in Brockton uh, in both Massachusetts and other states. So we've tailored a plan uh, to get this particular business up and running, which mostly is contained in, in a document called the opening day plan, which we've presented. Now, I'll get to that a little bit later. But just by way of some further background, um, the company is run by Stephen Jeff Perkins. Uh, this company is very suited to succeed in Brockton and in the rest of the state. I'm just gonna show you, I'm gonna do a screen share quickly. Uh, is it possible for me to do a screen share? It's saying it's disabled. Uh, it is disabled. Sorry. One second. Uh, you can try it now. Ah, great. Thank you. All right. I think you can probably see it now. Can everybody see? If somebody could nod, if you can see the inside of the dispensary. Thank you. All yeah, right. That's very clear. <clears throat> Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so this particular group has already built out a state-of-the-art cultivation and product manufacturing facility in Fitchburg, Mass. And what you're looking at is actually the retail store. This is scheduled to open up in the next 30 days, right upon Cannabis Control Commission approval. Um, and this really provides this company with a competitive advantage because there's a lot of demand for product right now across the state. There's not nearly enough supply. So a lot of the retailers that you're seeing that are coming before you 
uh, they're having to pay enormous wholesale prices to purchase their product. There simply isn't enough for everyone. This company doesn't have that problem because it produces its own uh, product. The other thing that this tells you is that it's a well-funded company. Uh, the other thing that you would probably see is not every operator that comes before you that gets a state license or gets permitted by you actually gets open. Um, this legalization has been around for four years in Massachusetts. There's less than 50 actual retail outlets open. Um, I know in Colorado, for example, four years into their legalization, there were hundreds open. Uh, you've got to be well funded, which this company is, and you've got to have the expertise uh, to understand the regulations, how to uh, do security. Uh, we work with the clients to provide that with them and this company is well suited. So that's my introduction. I'm gonna turn to some of the specifics now um, and I'm trying to figure out how to get off that picture. Hang on a second. All right, it's not letting me exit. Um, I, I'm hopeful that you have the materials though, because I can't seem to exit out of this. For the screen share. Hang on a second. I can turn off screen sharing if you wish. Yeah, you why don't we off? try that yeah. and then maybe I'll go back on to it uh, if possible. Thank you. All right. If you can turn it on again now, maybe I can screen share under the next uh, when I get a chance. Uh, there, I have another, I have a site plan that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Um, so first of all, as an initial matter, the company does have a host community agreement signed in September of 2018 by then Mayor Carpenter. Uh, the agreement provides for payment of about 3% of the gross revenues from the company to the city and some additional annual charitable donations. Business is gonna operate from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily in accordance with the bylaw. Uh, I should note, you know, often those, those hours are not that long. We often, uh, often trim them down because you find out that just the customer base doesn't need to have it open at eight in the morning or until eight at night. Uh, you know, we can certainly uh, uh, amend and let you know if we're gonna change those hours. So we're sort of asking for the, the max that's allowed by your zoning bylaw, but I suspect it's actually gonna be a little bit less than that. Uh, in the grand scheme of things. And, and just a reminder also uh, that there is no on-site consumption at this facility. This is strictly a retail sale facility. Um, all right, now I'm gonna try another screen share, um, which is the site plan. So can everybody see this, the site plan now? I'm, I'm gonna assume you can. Yep, I got it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so this property is a, in a portion of the basement floor of the building located at 4 Main Street. Uh, the company has no plans to make any exterior site changes to the existing conditions. The only change of any nature is that there are 27 parking spaces on this site. 12 of those are gonna be dedicated solely to this company's customers uh, with accompanying signage to that effect on each space. So, there, there is gonna be a sign that says Atlantic Medicinal Partners parking only on 12 spaces here. Uh, the company's employees are gonna be parking at an offsite garage, so they won't be using the parking here. Uh, as you can see, the entry to the parking area is through a curb cut on Court Street, and the building entrance is not actually on Main Street, but rather through that rear parking lot through a rear door in the lower right-hand side of the building. Um, as we've done with a lot of facilities and other urban environments, we do loading through the main front door uh, of the building through what we call a sally port. You know, one of these, there's a door that you have to get buzzed in through and then you can't get into the next door until you're buzzed in through that. That's where we do the loading. The Cannabis Control Commission has very uh, strict requirements regarding this. The, the transportation has to be uh, in a secure unmarked vehicle. Those vehicles have GPS and communication systems so that there's constant contact between our Fitchburg cultivation facility, the vehicle occupants in this Brockton facility. 
The deliveries occur using random routes and at random times. And most of these deliveries consist of two to three small totes, which contain the inventory. So what will happen is as, as the vehicle gets nearer, they'll contact uh, the Brockton facility. The people in that facility are ready and prepared for the arrival. The car pulls up right to the front there uh, where the door is, and it literally takes about a minute to unload that inventory, take it in through the entryway, uh, back to the uh, inventory area in the back of the facility where it's unloaded. All right. Um, sorry, last time, if we can just go through, uh, if we can shut that off so I can, oh, wait a sec. No, I can stop that share. Now I got it. And I'm gonna go back and give you one more change now for the floor plan. Here we go. All right. Um, here's the floor plan. Uh, as I'm sure you're familiar under the CCC regulations, these are limited access facilities. Uh, visitors enter through, I think you can see my cursor, through this main area into a vestibule. Before they even walk in, they have to show their ID. They are buzzed in and uh, then they're gonna walk over to this security reception window. They have to show their ID a second time. And by the way, they will have to show it a third time at the point of sale once they get in. Uh, but after this second check at the security vestibule, um, the, the customers get uh, buzzed into the main dispensary area here uh, where they will queue up and they meet with a customer service representative who gets their order and then takes them over to the point of sale stations where the transaction occurs. We have six point of sale stations here, uh, so we can handle quite a few customers at this facility. Um, the customers cannot get behind the point of sale area. They can't get into these other areas. This is all key card access, so they have no way of getting uh, to any of those areas outside that sort of sales floor area. Uh, once the sale is made, Customer takes the product, goes out the exit door, and all the way out into the parking lot. Um, next thing I'm gonna talk about is security. Um, Massachusetts has uh, one of the most stringent uh, security uh, protocols of any place in the country. Uh, in this place, we'll go above and beyond that. Now, I know that we're required to speak to the police department in conjunction with presenting this security plan for the uh, site review process by the planning board. Um, and as this is a public hearing, I can't be too specific about security plans, but I do wanna just run through the basic security overview for the board. Um, as you know from other projects, the facility has exterior cameras that allow for a 360 degree view of the exterior environment. Uh, on the inside, every door and window and every room where cannabis is stored or handled has to have cameras, and the footage is kept for 90 days, uh, which is required by state law. There's both a primary alarm system uh, and a backup alarm system in case that primary system is compromised, and there are numerous panic and duress alarms at various locations within the facility. All of this inventory at this facility is tracked by what's called a seed to sale tracking system. All product, the moment it reaches, the moment it's delivered to that facility, it is immediately weighed, inventoried, and you're, it's tagged and barcoded. Uh, and all of the weight figures are recorded. So um, there's going to be additional inv inventories at random times, daily, sometimes a couple of times a week, uh, every month. Um, and if it's found that a package, for example, that weighed one ounce last mm -hmm. week, this week only weighs a quarter of an ounce, you know there's a problem. The system's gonna tell you that, uh, and then the company's gonna review the videotape footage that it has, and if an individual was found to have diverted any inventory, uh, they are immediately terminated. There's a no tolerance policy under state law for any employee trying to divert uh, product. Uh, you can also see that there is a secure vault in that area. Um, it's, it's not impenetrable, but the idea of the security at this facility is that it's sort of a layered approach. Uh, you've got to get through the cameras, you've got to get through the alarms, you've got to get through several doors, then you get to that vault, which would take a, a bit of doing to actually get through. Uh, by that time, the police have been notified by the security system, 
um, and, and the problem is taken care of. Um, finally, there is on-site security personnel during business hours and the facility is monitored 24 seven. And all employees of this facility are subject to background checks. That's all per state regulations. Um, wanted to talk about one other section of your zoning bylaw that I think is important. Uh, there, there's a restriction in subsection six uh, that, that states that marijuana establishments have to operate without creating a nuisance in parking areas and adjacent streets and areas. And so one of the things we've provided you with is an odor control mitigation plan um, which, you know, I'm happy to answer questions about, but basically the concept is that we do control odor. Everything is prepackaged at the company's Fitchburg facility uh, in, in, uh, in, in packaging that's not going to allow that odor to escape. And there are other procedures that we do, but that's in the odor mitigation plan. And in addition, in terms of nuisance, we provided a traffic impact statement. Um, the gist of the traffic impact statement is that at a, at a peak hour of operation, which, which we've actually found in other places to be usually Friday afternoons, um, sometimes Saturdays, at that peak hour, this business could expect 28 vehicles seeking to access that parking area. Um, so the company has 12 dedicated parking spaces, but the reality is that those customers don't take an hour in their visit to this facility. In fact, the average visit is between seven to 10 minutes. So what we actually do is we use 15 minutes um, as sort of the, the schedule or the, the customer appointment time. So if you, if you assume that your 12 spaces can actually uh, serve 48 people, four times that amount because customers are only staying for 15 minutes. So again, we can serve 48 customers, but the peak demand at this facility under the traffic impact statement is 28 customers. So we believe we have more than ample parking. Um, so when I, when I do these meetings uh, across the state, which I've been doing for three or four years now, the next question I get is how would we handle uh, that initial period of operation or the high demand periods? Um, you know, especially initially, though, there's this sort of uh, initial curiosity factor that people in the area want to see how the facility is operating. And a lot of people can show up. So uh, the good news is that in Massachusetts, we're no longer seeing that crazy phenomenon that we saw when the first two uh, retail establishments opened up. Um, and, and part of that is the curiosity of war is worn off. But the other part is uh, at least I, I believe it's a plan that we've developed called an opening day plan. And we use this with virtually all of our clients across the state. And there's really three components. The first is that we provide police details for the first month of operations, or as long as the city through its police chief tells us we should continue doing it. Um, the truth is, uh, in just about every instance, the police chiefs after a couple of days realize it's not needed. Uh, and and they, they allow that to uh, cease, but, but they do have that um, ability to sort of keep that control uh, in, initially. The next thing that we do is we utilize parking lot attendance in the parking lot for the first three months of operation, or again, as long as the police chief would tell us they think it's necessary. The customers need to sort of get a feel uh, for this facility. They need to understand the flow and what they're supposed to do and where the parking is. And that's why we have the attendance there initially. And, and we've been pretty successful in making sure that the parking doesn't become problematic um, in that regard as well. And the final thing uh, we use is during the initial uh, month of operations, we use an appointment only system. Um, this allows us to control the number of people that come into this facility. Uh, and so what we would usually do is the way this works, this is not like, uh, for example, your, your local Walgreens or, or CVS where I just decide I'm going to go down there. What, what the clientele of this business generally do is they check out the company on its website. Okay, It's just very common because they want to see what products are available versus other retailers. And so on the website, it's going to make very clear during this period that this is appointment only. Do not come down here without making an appointment. And they, in fact, can make that appointment online. They can also call via the telephone and make an appointment that way. And we usually start with about five or six appointments every 15 minutes. 
And then we see how that's working. And if in fact, you know, it's, it's working fine and we think we can accommodate more, we'll up it to six or seven appointments per 15 minute period. Um, and usually again, what we found is we, we put the, the discretion with the police chief to see how this is working. And at some point, uh, you know, usually within the first week or so of operations, we're able to go to the police chief and say, is it okay for us to sort of move away from the appointment only? And we do it. But we also leave the discretion with the city. If there are subsequent problems, we may find, for example, uh, that at Thanksgiving, it's high demand. And it may be that the, the, uh, the city wants to sort of reimpose either uh, you know, parking lot attendants or a police detail or even appointment only. And we're happy to work with the city in that regard too. The idea, we, if, if the worst problem we have is that there's so much demand that we need to use appointments, it's not the worst uh, problem for the company to have. So we, we try to be flexible in that regard as well. So that's the opening day plan. Um, so I hope this sort of has given you an overview uh, of the operation. And if there's any questions we can answer, we'd be happy to. Very good. Any questions from the board? Uh, Chief, I have a question. Yep. Uh, so is Three this Smith. a Thank you. Is this a cash only business? So. Um, it used to, these businesses all used to be cash only, but Massachusetts has been very fortunate. We've got a couple of banks that we work with. So actually, most of these businesses operate with debit cards. There is some cash, but most people opt to use a debit card. Thank you. Uh, are the deliveries of, uh, coming from Fitchburg, what, what hours are the deliveries? Are they scheduled well, at specific times during the day or are they scattered? They're scattered. It's, they don't even drive the same route and they, it's different times, different days. Um, it's usually probably two times a week, maybe three times a week if the company's you know, had a lot of sales over a week. But it, it could be at any time of the day. We, we just do it randomly. So nobody can understand a pattern. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, all the deliveries will be done during daylight hours between eight and eight. Correct. Can you explain to us, can you explain to us what you intend to do for signage on the building? So um, I, I think what you would see is something very small right near the door. Uh, it, again, there's no need at a facility like this to have any kind of neon signs or large signs. The idea is to be discreet. It's really for wayfinding purposes only. So you'd be seeing a small sign could be as small as uh, maybe one foot by two feet right near the door. Good, thank you. And the, the parking spaces in the lot, the owner of that property is designating 12 spaces to you. Do you have any idea what the other 12 spaces is that sufficient for whatever else is in that building? I, I'm, I'm told by the, land, the landlord, you know, looked into this and wanted, this is sort of how we arrived at the number, uh, was that that would work for the rest of the building. I can't tell you the specific uses. I think there's some uh, offices, there may be a dental office, that sort of thing. It's not high volume though in that building. When somebody leaves to your establishment and goes out into the corridor to exit the building, is there something that prevents them from taking a right and going into the main part of the building, or do they have to go in the outside door? Um, in other words, can they walk up a set of stairs and come out on Main Street? I, I think they could. Um, you know, in, in theory, they could do that. It's like any other business that might occupy this building. If if it's a preference of the board, we could uh, provide some signage at the e exit uh, requiring people that utilize this business to exit through the parking lot. I think that's the most likely way they are going to exit um, just because that's the way they will have come in. Well, as one member of the board, I think that would be important so sure. that they're not wandering through the building. And the whole idea of not putting this on the ground floor on Main Street was to kind of prohibit that from happening. So. I think that's fine. We'd be happy to put, if there was a condition to the special permit that we add some signage directing customers to the parking lot exit, we'd be happy to do that. Great, thank you. 
Any other questions from the board? I have a question. Chief. So um, you mentioned in the early stages of the operation that be police details possibly on scene. Um, as time went on, as if these details were eliminated, what do you have in place for the safety of the customers leaving the building? In other words, is the, is the parking lot monitored by security, not other than just cameras, I mean a security guard. Um, I have a slight concern in this neighborhood for the safety of the customers leaving the building. Uh, understood. Um, so, I, listen, we do have on-site security personnel, and I think if it was, uh, this is something we want to talk to the police chief about. If it's the preference of the police chief that that security personnel is stationed outside in the lot to provide sort of a, uh, a deterrent, I think we'd be happy to do that as well. True, that, that, that's one of my concerns. It's just, like I said, um, a customer being uh, robbed, let's say, of their product or what have you, uh, as they were making their way to the vehicle. Uh, understood. Again, as I said, it's not a one size fits all. We, we'll try to adapt to what the city wants in that regard. We haven't seen that sort of thing uh, in Massachusetts because it's the cameras, you know, tend to deter people. But I don't want to. I don't want to make that assumption. I'll, I'd prefer to rely on your police chief to tell me, you know, that that this if this is the method, that's what we'll do. Great. Thank you. Uh, just one comment before I open it up. I, I will tell you that on others that we have approved, uh, we have not varied from the hours that are in the ordinance. And it sounds like you may not even be using those hours, the full benefit of those 12 hours. Is that correct? I, I, I think we would assume at this point that we are going to use them. Um, mm -hmm. My assumption, though, is, you know, if it's a, it, it's probably just better for everyone uh, if, if we lessen the hours because it's just not the necessary demand, um, maybe we do that. And I don't know if that means that we're allowed to just do that or if you want us to come back and let you know that we're doing that, but either way is fine. I think what we're looking at is the maximum hours that you can't open before 8 a.m. You can't and, stay open past 8 p.m. And we would abide by that, certainly. Good. Any other questions from the board? Uh, yeah, question. Mr. Bernard. Our, um, uh, Steve and Steve and Jeff Perkins are, are the 50/50 owners of of the uh, of, of Atlantic Met, uh, Met, uh, additional uh, partners. Or, the, or how, can you tell me more about the corporate structure. Sure. Uh, there's another owner, Frank Sieri. There's three owners. Um, there are some other individual investors that don't actually. It's more of a monetary uh, investment, not not a control uh, investment. But the day-to-day -day people that are really making the decisions for this company are Steve and Jeff Perkins. Okay. And is this is this a, a, a franchise or is it a, 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 a limited liability corporation? What? Uh, Atlantic, I believe, is a corporation. It could be an LLC, but I believe it's a corporation. And when you say franchise, the you know, the, these companies, any company in Massachusetts is only able to have three retail locations. So mm -hmm. one of theirs is in Fitchburg um, and one of them uh, would be here in Brockton. And there may be one other as well in another location that hasn't been determined yet. But it, it, it's just, it's prohibited to be anything further than that. The state is very adamant about sort of not allowing any particular company to have a monopoly on operations within the state. If, if the owners if the owners were here, they could maybe answer this question better, or maybe maybe are hired to do so. What is their their five year plan? Is it a five year plan to build a business and sell to a national uh, cannabis uh, corporation, or or uh, to build the business and uh, uh, build build profit and uh, and ride away and sail away in a ship somewhere? Sure, Steve, are you on? Yes, I uh, I'm talking. I am here. I am uh, there, here. Go ahead. I, can you guys hear me? Yep. Uh, th thank you everybody for your time tonight. A um, little background, AMP is an all Massachusetts ownership group. We're all local people, um, three different entrepreneurs that have had success in various industries. And um, we're three years into this and finally growing and finally, uh, like Phil said earlier, 30 days from hopefully opening in Fitchburg. 
after a pause for the coronavirus. Um, our plan is to run this for a good number of years. Um, like Phil alluded to, we also have the go ahead for construction to begin in Salem, Massachusetts. And um, we don't have any plan currently um, and haven't even spoken to anybody about selling to any type of national conglomerate or any of those type of uh, umbrella control situations that you may have read in the globe or anything like that. It is really three Massachusetts people with Massachusetts investors that believe and uh, been working really hard on what we're doing. Great. Great. Thank you very much for that. No problem, sir. Okay, the board's all set. Good. We're going to close that portion of the hearing and we're going to open it up for public discussion. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? I'm going to ask that anybody that wishes to speak online to please raise your hand through the Zoom program. John? Okay, seeing now I'm going to close that portion of hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Nobody. Nobody. Okay, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there any public official that wants to speak on the issue? Seeing nobody, I'll close that portion of the hearing. Have we received any documentation for or against? Okay, I'm going to close the public discussion portion of this hearing and uh, I'm now going to open it up for deliberation by the board. Any comments from the board? I'll open the comments. Mr. Bernard. I, I thought that the uh, representative, Mr. Silverman, did a good job of uh, um, giving, <coughs> of explaining the, the, the business in, in detail. Uh, I was also impressed with the uh, the brief that was presented to the uh, to the board members uh, for <laughs> examination. Quite thorough. All the documents seem to be uh, seem to be uh, in place. I was very happy that the uh, the owners were on the line and could answer answer the question as to the as to uh, to their goals. Uh, so I was, I was impressed with the uh, presentation. Thank you. Any other board members? I will say that all of the check marks that we're looking for on retail sales, as far as documents that need to be presented to the board, uh, have all been presented. And I will also mention that in cooperation with my fellow board member, I thought the package was very well put together and, and uh, it was very complete. So the stipulations that I mentioned to him is that according to the city ordinances, they cannot open before 8 a.m. They must be closed by 8 p.m. and they can operate seven days a week. Nothing can be going in and out of this building between eight o'clock at night and eight o'clock in the morning and they will have no less than 12 parking spaces that will be set aside specifically for their use. Uh, uh, Chief? Yes. Uh, they mentioned that uh, during the, the uh, uh, opening, the, that they'll have uh, a police detail for the first month, a parking lot attendant, and a, a port, uh, appointment, appointment only system. Uh, I think that should be included in the stipulations, do you not? We can do that. Yeah. We were looking at possibly the first month or until it's no longer needed. Yeah, the, until it's no longer needed. Uh, please yeah, yeah. It, between the operator and the police chief, they would make that decision. Honestly, I think in the first month that they're open with the traffic that's on Court Street, they are going to have to do that. 
So that's a good thing. All right. Anyone you want to make a motion? Make a motion to Stipulate grant. stipulations, I'll make a motion to grant. Second. Se second. Motion has been made and seconded to grant. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bernard. Mr. Bernard. Yes. 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 To grant. Mr. Smith. Yes. Yes. Mr. Lanius. Yes. Chief Williams. Yes. 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 Chairman Gallagher. Yes. Chief Williams. Yes. Chairman Gallagher. Yes. That is the 5-0 vote. 5-0 vote. Okay, the vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted. Thank you, gentlemen. Yep. We good? The next petition, 20-43, the petition of James Meeks, 36 Draper Street, Brockton, Mass, for a variance from section 27-9, 27-14, 27, 13A, to subdivide and construct a single family home while leaving the existing home that was previously approved but expired in an R1C zone located at 78 Kingland Street. We, I'm just here to try to get an extension on an already approved subdivided lot, like the gentleman said, with an existing house on it. Um, the owner had a little problem with the banks, so that's what took us so long to get through it. I thought it was going to be a quick fix, but it wasn't. Now it's all rectified, and we're just looking for an extent, another year extension for this. Again, it's already been approved to be uh, to be subdivided. You all set? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are uh, there any questions from the board? I just, I don't know. It's going to be a Draper Street. You, you, you're familiar with the neighborhood. It's going to be on Draper Street, but it's a Kingman Street address where it is now. Once we subdivide it, it'll be divided Kingman and Draper. Yeah. I mean, it's already subdivided. Once we stop building, it's going to be a great pursuit address. These plans that you've submitted tonight are marked October 5th, 2018. So these are the exact same plans that we approved last time. So yes, sir. no changes. Yes, sir. Okay. So I don't have the previous zoning in front of me, but maybe the secretary can check that i'm just checking to see if we put any stipulations on that
All right, so this was James Meeks, 36 Draper Street, August 18th, 2018. That's the one we're referring to. Yes. And the stipulations that were required that night was the existing shed was to be removed, green space was to remain as shown on the plan, and stormwater disbursement was to be as shown on the plan. Yes, I, I'm a little hot of hammering, so I, he's hammering for me if you don't mind. Is the shed gone or is it still there? The shed is gone. Gone. So that had to be removed. The green space as shown on the plan. That's going to still stay the same. Thing. Okay, what the board is looking for here when we say that is that the plan shows the driveway. We don't want to come back a year later and find the whole front yard is all blacktop. No. Because that I live in a neighborhood, sir, so it's going to be just as nice as our house. That's why that stipulation is there. Yeah and the stormwater disbursement is shown on the plan. So you can't exacerbate the water runoff to any of the neighbor's lots. The base fluctuations in the recharge, yeah. Okay. So you're okay with those stipulations? I am, yes, sir. Okay. All right, I'm gonna close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? No notifications? Okay. I'm gonna close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Nobody? I'm gonna close that portion of the hearing. Is there any public official that wants to speak on the issue? No public officials. Okay, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing and now I'm going to open it up for deliberations from the board. Any comments from the board? Mr. Burnett. I can't hear you. Uh, uh, Chief, do you still have the August 18? Uh, minutes. I, yes. I wanted to know, yeah, was, was I present for that uh, that vote? Yes, you were. Okay, and it voted in the affirmative. Yes. Okay. Thank you, because I, I didn't re I didn't recall it. <laughs> Thank you. So we went all through this in August of eighteen. It was granted unanimously in eighteen, and then apparently it. The one year expired and he's back with the exact same plan right now. That's the way I understand it. Motion to approve. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bernard. Yes. Ms. Smith. Yes. Mr. Lannis. Yes. Chief Williams. Yes. Chairman Galligan. Yes. Chairman Galligan, that's a five to zero in the favor. Okay, the vote is five affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted with the stipulation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Russell. just for my decision. I'll make sure you get it back. Hi, my name is John O'Brien. I'm uh, Hold on. Hold on just a minute. Next. 
Okay, the next petition before us is 20-44. The petition of Emery Rizek, manager of EEE Investment Group, LLC, 48 Swanson Terrace, Stoughton, Mass. For permission to change the record, stating this home is a one family only when it's been used as a two family in the past in an R3 zone located at 3234 Arthur Street. So the situation here is we have city records that says it's one family. Uh, he is going to try to tell us it's a two family, correct? That's right. My, my name is John O'Brien. I'm an attorney in Boston. I represent ME Rizdick and uh, EEE Investment Group. Um, I apologize if my internet connection is a little glitchy. Where I am isn't, isn't uh, fantastic, but please bear with me. You're um, very good. Emmy, Emmy contacted me after he ran into an issue with the uh, building department. He purchased the home with the understanding it was two family. It appears on the assessor's database as a two family. Um, he finished the, the interior, put a lot of effort and time into construction materials. And then when he came to have the plumbing approved, discovered that it was not okay. Um, it's only a one family. So he sent in his application um, to have it um, adapted and recognized as a two family in the R3 zone. Um, it can't be recognized as a right because the um, as a right two family is pretty small in that in that area. It's um, one unit per 1,200 square feet. Uh, on a one acre lot size. Here we have two units. One is 900 square feet. The other unit is 725 square feet and the acreage is uh, a 15th of an acre. So it's, it's too small. Um, there are four parking spaces to be used with the home, dedicated spaces on the lot. Um, the exteriors will stay the same. And notably the house has always been a two family. Um, the prior owner, I believe, and I understand from Emmy, sent a letter into the ZBA explaining that this has always been used as a two family um, and the, the bylaws have, have evolved since, uh, since it was originally built about a hundred years ago. Um, my issue with what Emmy submitted is he didn't state precisely what he's looking for. He just said, I'm looking for relief. And from, from my experience, if it's a special permit, um, that special permit would only apply to Emmy and would not apply to future owners. And Emmy purchased this home with the intent of, of reselling it, of fixing it, uh, making it nicer inside and finding a buyer. <laughs> we have a buyer on the hook, um, but we wanna know if, um, if a permit is granted, will it extend uh, far down the road to, to subsequent owners? So I believe it should have been specified that he's asking for a variance. Um, you can educate me differently and, and tell me that there are other methods in, in Brockton that apply for future owners to be um, uh, to have confirmation that it, it is a two family and, and that two family designation will last in time. I think you're correct in requesting a variance and if you understand what a variance is you need to give us a couple of hardships on what's unique about this piece of property. Well, I think the hardship is that he, he purchased it with the understanding that it, that it is a two family. Um, structurally it came as a two family. It, it always had a a distinct area between the, the, the two family zones. Um, and he invested a significant amount of cash in, in fixing the home. So the hardship would be saying, Emmy, you invested in this thing as a two family. It's really a one family. Your money is gone. Okay. So the hardship is unique to him and it's a financial hardship based upon city records. Right, his assumption that at the time of purchase, uh, his review of the tax record led him to believe it was two family, um, but that was somewhat insufficient. Uh, it turned out it was, it was not after he did the work and the building department said, uh, no, you, you need, you know, you need a, a change in, in, in recognition of the home. And the home, it doesn't. The book. I'm sorry. Go ahead. My view is that it doesn't substantially derogate, as it has always been a two-family, and the neighbors uh, recognize it as a two-family, and, and it, it has been viewed that way. Um, so we're not taking um, a home and, and blowing it up in size, turning it into a McMansion, and saying, "Oh, it's two families." Um, 
it, it's now worth you know ten times the value. Any questions from the board? Questions. I have a question. What are you going to do with the shed that's in the backyard? Emmy, you on the line? Let me text him. He's here. He's here. Yes, I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for your time today. Um, the shed was there. Um, I wasn't thinking of doing anything with the shed. I can either move it as far as it can be moved against the fence in the back. Um, but when I, when uh, the home inspector, when the inspector went to the house, didn't say anything in reference to the shed, but anything that has been said so far to me, uh, we have done. Okay, um, the question I bring up the shed is it's sitting right in the middle of the yard and I don't see a parking plan here for off street parking. Uh, can you tell the board what you plan to do about parking? I think the shed is sitting right where you want to put your parking. Yeah, no, I can move it right to the back. There's plenty of space and it's not, um, the shed is up in the air. It's just only on blocks. So I can move it all the way to the back and there'll be plenty of space for probably five to six cars. Uh, as he was uh, presented to me by the, uh, the person that did the, uh, the land survey. Okay, you would need parking for four vehicles off the street. It would make right. sense to move that shed. It has to be 10 feet from the property line and you need to maintain green space in the backyard. Yes, that, yes, sir. There's plenty of space for green and uh, to be, you said 10 feet from the back fence? Yes, from the side of the prop, back property, 10 feet. And yes. What I'm saying is I think you have more than sufficient area for parking, but if you're going to blacktop enough for four cars, you've got to leave green space. You follow what I'm saying to you? Yes, sir. Okay, and my other question is the plan. How do you get from the second floor in the back to the ground? Where's the second means of egress? Um, it's coming, it's not done yet because I was waiting for um, your this meeting to take place. But there is a second door that's going to be um, from the side of the second floor living room going to the back of the house. Uh, there's going to be a stairwell that's going to go down there with a little balcony. Is that an exterior stairwell? Yes, sir. Which side of the house is it going to be on? Uh, the side where the parking lot is going to be, but it's going to go all the way to the back with the where the back uh, where the back to where the kitchen is near there. All right. So when I was there looking at this site, I saw a door that said wipe your feet before you come in at the first floor level. I assume that one only goes to the first floor. No, that goes to both floors. There's a there's a door there and then there's a stairs to the side. There's a, a hallway that leads to the first floor and then there's a set of stairs that go up to the second floor and there's another door up on the second floor. So if that's all in, why do you need an exterior stairway? I was just thinking that um, just for safety purposes, we would need a second exit. Well, by state code, you're going to have to have a front entrance and a back entrance. All I saw on the plane was the front entrance. I didn't see the back. That's why I had the question. So you're telling us that the stairway is there, and then you're telling us you're going to add a stairway in the back. Okay, maybe I'm, I didn't explain myself, cor myself correctly. There's a set of stairs when you first walk in to go up to the second floor. In the rear. Say that again? In the rear or the front? The front. Okay, yep, go ahead. No, in the back will be the second set of stairs that I'm going to build as a second exit. That's the stairwell that's going to lead to the in the outside of the house. And that will be on the rear of the house, not on the side. Correct. So that will not impede any cars that are using that driveway to get to the back parking area? Oh, not at all. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. I'll open up public discussion. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Mr. Chair, I would ask that anyone that wishes to, um, to speak in favor to raise their hands on the Zoom.
I see none at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay, nobody's speaking in favor. I'm gonna close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone who wants to speak in opposition? Please raise your hand. I see none, Mr. Chair. Okay, we see none. I'm gonna close that portion of the hearing. Is there any public officials that wanna speak on the issue? I see none, Mr. Chair. Okay, nobody has indicated from public officials they wanna speak, so I'm gonna close that portion of the hearing. I will now open it up for the board for public, uh, for board's discussion. Deliberations. Uh, excuse me, Chief. I, um, I'd like to speak. Um, I think that um, through your discussion that this petitioner has some more documents that um, needs to be added to this application and um, something that he uh, could have put in the plans but wasn't sure at the time when he did apply uh, for that second egress and uh, driveway. Um, so um, I, I just think that there's some added documentation that needs to be added. Okay. Apparently the issue with this case is the fact that some city documents indicate that the house was a single family while others say it was two. When I checked with the assessor's office, they are assessing this house as a two family. The records in the building department indicate a single family. I then went further back in the city records and back to 1949, it was listed as a two family. So 1949, 1951, 53, 55 to 58, all showed it as two families living in that house. So I don't know what happened to the records, but apparently the records were in dispute and uh, that's one of the reasons we're here tonight to try to straighten out the record keeping of the house what it actually is is it a two family or a single family and if it is granted as a two family he will have to put their second means of egress in otherwise he will not get an occupancy permit from the building inspector and i don't disagree with you it's, it's too bad there wasn't another document that showed that but the building department will make sure the second egress is in there. So it's basically a situation here where we're trying to straighten out what the house is actually classified as. Any other comments from the board? Anybody want to make a motion? Uh, no, I'd like to make a motion to grant, and I'd like to explain the reason why the. Um, where you clarified that this is uh, considered a, uh, our tax as a, a two family going back to 1949. Uh, uh, we know in fact that we're not, we're not being duped uh, as far as uh, uh, they're, they're trying to convert a, a one family into a two family. Uh, also where, where it has been used as a two family for a number of years, uh, the representative of the, of the council uh, clearly stated that it's not a derogate from the neighborhood because the, the neighbors are used to it being a two a two family. Uh, along with your your saying that uh, if it is going to be cleared up as a two family, they have to be a, a second means of egress uh, added. Um, I think that covers uh, covers all bases, uh, albeit agreeing uh, with Jerry that it would be nice to have have it in the plan. I think there's enough evidence here to to uh, 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 motion to grant. Just on that motion, if it's a motion yet, or just a comment. Uh, what I researched was that the records for the occupants in that house showed two families. I don't know how it was taxed back in 49 and 50, but it definitely showed two different families living in the house. <laughs> my, my, my comment is now a, a motion to grant. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to grant. The clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bernard. Yes. Ms. Smith. Yes. Mr. Lanus. Yes. Chief Williams. Yes. Chairman Galligan. Yes. 
Mr. Chair, that is a five or zero. All in favor. So the vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted. Thank you. Good evening. I might say on that one too, I'm going to make a notation that he agreed to meet that uh, shed. Sir, for Mr. Newbear? Yes. You're up. So before I start the hearing, I need to ask you, do you want to withdraw? No, I do not. Okay. The next petition before the board tonight is 20-45, the petition of Greg Logan, 2185 Pleasant Street, Dighton, Mass, for permission to convert a two-family home into a three-family home in an R3 zone located at 35 Newberry Street. Please give your name to the clerk. It's all set? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, my name is Greg Logan. I'm representing the petitioner, Nikolai Alves. He resides at uh, 35 Newberry Street in Brooklyn. Nikolai Alves purchased this property in 2015, um, and it was a two-family house with a garage and an apartment on the side of the garage, um, as well as the apartment went over the second floor of the one half of the door. On August 13, 2019, Mr. Alves had a fire in the garage. Um, when the fire came into the garage, it was catastrophic. The garage area went smoke and water went through the actual apartment that was attached to the existing garage. I was having to remove all the water and smoke and sheetrock and all the insulation, so I brought it down to bare studs. We built this garage back to the actual same structure that was there, minus one section of the back of the garage. Um, you only had one means of egress in the existing home. Um, in order to make it adequate, you have to have on two separate sides of the walls. So I ended up going ahead and putting one on the front and I on the back of the property. If you look over in this section here, you'll see there's a set of stairs over here in the back of the property. That's the only thing that projects beyond the existing footprint that was put, that was there originally. Um, I was so after I went to the, look at the project after the fire and the insurance company, and I went down to the building department. And I seen the building inspector made a set of drawings for what we were going to put, Mr. I uh, forgot his gentleman's name, I apologize, but uh, I was issued a permit number 2787 to go ahead and put the structure up. We got it, like I said, we got it the existing structure, we did everything that we needed to do on that. So before I can get a frame inspection, I have to call in your subcontractors, which are your plumbers, your electricians, and things of this nature. So all of them, you know, their pre drillings, notchings, all the things that they would be doing, I can make an inspector come through and approval. At that point in time, when the electrician went down to pull the permit, for a third meter to the structure, it was notified that, hey, uh, yeah, Greg, this is a two family, you have to go in front of the zone board of appeals. So this is where I'm at at this moment in time with this particular structure. This was an existing condition. Um, when Nikolai's purchased this home, like it was an in-law apartment with the uh, garage, um, all we're trying to do is nothing's changing on the actual structure. We're just trying to get an extra meter so that right now his son and his grandchild live where the garage was with a car for a fire inside the park. Um, all he's trying to do right now is just keep it the same as it was, but we're just trying to make it so we can get an extra third meter for the property. Um, I've had it all done out by Outback Engineering. Outback Engineering has come out and they've located all the spots on the drawings for all your car locations where they might need to be in two and the two car garage. We meet all the requirements with the off street parking for the particular property. I don't feel that that would be a, a problem. I don't think it's sentimental to the neighborhood. Uh, it's nothing, it's on the existing footprint. The only, like I said, the only thing I did build was this set of stairs right here to make it egressible. Thank you. Thank you. That it? Yes. Okay, any questions from the board?
You said on your application that there has been no application to uh, the board relative to this site. And I would just enlighten you that there was a request to convert this building into a three family dwelling on January 10th, 2006. And that was unanimously denied. So there has been some activity here. Okay. The, the building that is in the back that's in question. Yes. The original photos that I have got my hands on here of that building was in the, in the fifties, that building was built as a garage. This was a doctor's home. It was a single family home for years. Somehow in the, in the past, this was made into a two family. So there was a family living on the first floor and another one on the second floor. Apparently now what you're trying to do is put a third family in here who would live over the garage. Yeah, there was like, a, a, I didn't know it was, came in front of the board prior to this. That's something I never knew about. Um, when the insurance company paid Mr. Al's, it was listed to them as, that's on their shame on them. However, um, it was listed as the apartment slash garage needed to be rebuilt. That's what I had priced out. Um, I did not know that it was, uh, came in front of the Board of Appeals in 2006. Mr. Al's purchased the property in 2015. Already okay, done. so I just want to mention that, make sure you understand that I understand this, that that building that's in the back that's in question was a separate garage. It was not attached to the house. Okay, when I got involved, it was, sir. I'm sorry. All right, so here we have a situation where somebody has built a residential unit on top of that garage. We, we have no records of that. And they have also connected the garage to the house so that the garage and the house now are connected. Well, when I took the house apart, I told you after the fire went through the water and smoke damage, I had to bring down the, all the studs down to their studs. Right here's the main body of the house. This section right here and all this was definitely built in the 50s. You could see all the plywood, all the two bys, all the type of That's material was built in back in the day. So it was a connection to the existing house. Matter of fact, when I got into this particular section right here, when the building inspector comes up to do his frame inspection, he's going to notice that I had to do some upgrades due to the floor joists were too far apart for the span for the elasticity of the lumber. So I had to do some marrying to it. So that was there for years, whether I'm not denying that somebody might have done it prior to me getting involved, but this is definitely built in the same era as the garage, this section that connected to the house. So it is attached to the house. Um, but um, like I said, Mr. Al's, is, he was on the first floor, the family member lives on the second floor, and his, his son and his uh, grandchild live on this section. Okay, I, I just want you to know that I have photos mm -hmm. of this plot that shows the garage converted into a living space upstairs, and it is nowhere near connected to the house. So several things happened here before you came on the scene. Probably, yes. Okay, so the fire that occurred was a car fire inside the garage. Yes. It did not demolish the building. The, the actual garage needed to come down slash when all the smoke and water went into the apartment side. So I actually had to take down, I didn't take, I, I took three walls down, the existing dividing wall from the apartment to the garage stayed. Only thing inside that apartment side, all I had to do was cut it out because it was obviously wet from the water. So is, is there an apartment on the first floor? There's a, it's so if, if you can picture this. I was there, I saw it. So yeah, there's so a walk-in door. Yes, yeah, so you walk in this door here. This right here, walk into a living room, kitchen, a set of stairs that went upstairs. And this garage went to about right, I mean, the second floor went to right here. And this was the lower roof, this little section right here. Not so what you're asking, what you're asking for tonight is for that little addition that's on the left side of the garage? Yeah, it's pretty much this section here, and it goes over the top of the garage. I had to make a means of egress because it yeah, well, never passed. That's all there now. Yes. It has been built. Okay, and, and just another question. Uh, I will make a comment that the owner of this property has paved every square inch of this property. There is absolutely no green space whatsoever. Exactly, except for right here in that stone. I noticed that myself. This, this you might be able to grow a pot of flowers in that corner. And I'm not being wise, yeah. but I'm just saying 
there is no green space. Definitely so not. what he has done is paved the entire yard and cars are parked everywhere. And I have no idea how many people are living in this building right now. There's two downstairs, two upstairs, and then the grandchild, child, fiance, and the, the son. So we're all together. Is there anybody together. living on the top floor? Yes. Yes, there's, there's a, a family member lives upstairs with a, with her fiance. Um, okay, so, so it's a family have, member. The, this right here, this part, this part, this part. When I was doing the work, because this was a loss due to the fire, I was able, with these cars still being parked here, coming in early in the morning with a dumpster truck, be able to back right down here, unload the dumpster, take a 16 foot enclosed trailer, turn around and back it right in. Um, so there is adequate parking on this side of the house. Whether he has vehicles parked over here, I don't believe so. He has a fence here. I'm not saying that they don't, but this is where we're adequately parked, trying to put it. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, and two in the garage. Very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there any other questions from the board? If not, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. I'm going to open it up to public discussion. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? I'd advise if there's anyone in favor to raise their hand by Zoom. No documentations, nothing come in. No Nothing. Questions. Okay, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Am I able to speak? Okay, please give your name to the clerk. My name is Sonia Butler. And what's your address? 10 Nye Square. It's a single family home. And I would just ask the board to keep in mind, um, I live in a single family home and I'm looking at my street right now. There are only four homes on my street that are single family homes. And then there are one, two, three, four homes uh, that are multifamily homes. One of the multifamily homes um, with three floors um, their family alone has eight cars and a fourth of those cars are parked in front of my home. And so as you know, we have these side streets that are densely packed. Um, they are not always favorable when it comes to weather conditions and uh, they are not also favor favorable when it comes to situations like we're in this pandemic right now. And so parking becomes an issue. I mean, the eight cars are just for family members. Now, there are two other floors in that home because there's a three family home that are used for residents. And so um, considering that Brockton does not have a parking permit um, plan, or maybe um, that's something that you know will be looked at in the future, I just ask the board to consider that when they are approving um, homes to be transitioned from a two family or one family to a larger family home especially for those who are in a single family home and you're trying to get into your home in the evening after you've been at work, you know, for the day and then you come to your home. And um, there have been probably maybe um, six doc documented calls from my home uh, because I can't get into my driveway or get out of my driveway because someone who's in a three family home is parked there. Okay, and which street do you want again? Nye Square. Square, okay. Uh -huh. So you're speaking in opposition to this then? I would just like the board to consider um, my experience. Okay, so your concerns. Okay, yes. very good. All right, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this issue? Seeing no others, I'm gonna close that portion of the hearing. Is there any public officials that wanna speak on this issue? You're not seeing any chair. Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. I'll now open it up for deliberations from the board. 
the board members have any comments? Mr. Bernard. Uh, I, I too recall, I'm going to age myself, that, that being a one family house, another one, <coughs> grand one family house on Newbury Street. How we got from one family to three family it just uh, baffles me, along with, a, a, uh, I went by the house too, totally paved. I, it's, uh, that's, I find that very discouraging. They, so they've taken what was designed to be in uh, a one family home and created a, 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 a potential uh, problem with no consideration for, 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 for green space. As much as we need uh, uh, housing uh, in the city of Brockton, we need Brockton, we don't need congestion and, and blacktop in all of our grand old neighborhoods. Uh, I'm disappointed that uh, uh, that uh, this one family or grand old home would be converted, thought of being converted to a three family home. Comments. Thank you. Any other board member comments? I will just reiterate uh, Mr. Bernard's thoughts this, I believe, was Dr. Small's house years ago. It was a single family house. Uh, there was many of these in the downtown area. And this has been converted into a two family with actually a, a full apartment with family members apparently living up on the top floor. In order to get some parking for this house, they have totally blacktop the and cement the side yard, the front yard, there's absolutely no green space whatsoever. The pictures that I have of this house several years ago show the whole front of the yard, all grass, green space, trees, and area track. There was a building in the back that was attempted to be made into a, another living area. The code says there cannot be two dwellings on the same lot. So it appears to me this may have been an end run where they tied the garage to the house to make it look like it's all one unit. Uh, this is a mess. Uh, they got parking everywhere over here. Uh, it's, it's, it's too many units for that lot. And I, I think the, the owner or somebody here has gone ahead and done a lot of things here without permits. And now when they want to get an electric meter, they can't get a meter because they've got a separate dwelling that's in the back. So this was a carriage house. It was a garage in the back that sometime in the past has been converted into a living space. As the petitioner said tonight, there was a kitchen and everything, a living space in the building. And I just think it's way too dense for that piece of property. There is insufficient parking. Uh, Parking on the plan has showed that it is stacked all the way down the driveway. Uh, it's a mess. I, I, I don't think that this house should be anything more than a two family. And quite frankly, the, uh, the paving that they've put in front of that house should be removed. It's an eyesore to the neighborhood. That's all I got to say. Any other board members want to speak? We all set? I would entertain a motion. Move to grant with the hopes that it fails. Motion has been made to grant. Somebody second that? Teresa, second. Motion has been made and seconded to grant. All those in favor of granting, please, on a roll call by the clerk. Mr. Bernard. No. Ms. Smith. No. Mr. Lannis. No. Chief Williams. No. Chairman Galligan. No. Mr. Chair, that's zero in favor, five against. So the vote is five in the negative, none in favor. The petition is denied.
Thank you. Okay, the next petition is already. Do you want to mute yours or is it already muted? I think I muted it. Are the petitioners ready? Yes. I will just ask you before we start, do you want to withdraw or do you want to go forward? I'll go forward. Okay, very good. Mr. Chair? Yeah. I wish to ask the um, petitioners to, to mute one of their microphones and speakers. Yeah. Right. You hear that? Right. I'll mute mine. Does that do it? That's much better. Yeah, that's great. There's a thing in the corner that should say mute. I muted. I just muted. Oh, okay. oh it's back again. All right, just give me a five count and see how it sounds. One, two, three, four, five. Perfect. All right, the next petition. We're not the only ones. Actually, they only need one microphone, right? Yes. Oh, it's the speakers. They're two speakers. One speakers, one is the microphone coming out. Back feeding. Yeah. Okay. You know, if you only have one speaker, we can hear you very well. Yeah, sorry, but we just we had two separate screens. Yeah, we was two we were on two separate screens, but we just fixed it. Okay, great. Petition number twenty forty six, the petition of Anthony Valentine. 239 County Street, Taunton, Mass, for a special permit and variance from Section 2727 for a tattoo parlor in an R3 zone located 33 Dover Street. So the issue here is a tattoo parlor is not allowed in this area because it's R3, so he is going to be requesting a variance. Okay, make your presentation. Um, I'm... I'm Actually, uh, currently uh, working. Just identify yourself first. Uh, my name is Anthony Valentin, and um, and I was just trying to apply for a variance to um, to open up a one man tattoo parlor. And um, I'm actually currently been working for three years professionally, and I'm I just want to open my own and trying to see if I can get approved for it. Is there any particular reason you picked this location? Um, not really. It was it was um, it was just kind of just looking around and and I know the the business uh, the the commercial building well, so it's it's kind of like where I grew up around here. So it was just kind of yeah, it's a good fit for my uh, type of business I'm trying to open. And you have three years experience in this. Yes, professional. Where have you been prior to coming here? Um, I work currently at a K and M Tattoo Studio, and uh, for two years professionally. And then uh, before that, I was working in Brockton Inc. on uh, North Main Street, it's North Main Street right? okay. South Main Street uh, for a year there. Mm -hmm. So now you're in business for yourself. Yeah. Well, try. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right, any questions from the board? Mr. Bernard. Congratulations on your willingness to go into business on, on your own. Could you just uh, describe uh, uh, your business process from the, from the, from the Point that a customer walks into your door to the time that he leaves, what uh, what run processes happen uh, um, while it, while he's in there? For instance, if uh, I were to come if I were to come in, would I would I come in by appointment? Would I would I walk in, and, and what would happen? 
Well, um, usually um, I'm actually um, appointment only because I have a, a large amount of uh, customers on, on hold right now. And due to the coronavirus, I'm also only doing appointments regardless. So I'm just, um, yeah, I, I, well, the first step I would do, um, if you came in, I would, I, obviously you would, you would call me and then we make a set up an appointment for the day. You leave a deposit for the day and then uh, you come in and then I take uh, your information, make a copy of your license and um, have you fill out a form to make sure you, uh, you are aware of what's going on and what's going to happen to, uh, in, in, in the time there. And, um, and then after that, uh, sign the papers, make copies of the license, give it back to you, and then um, just have you sit down, get the stencil ready, and uh, work up the drawing, and, and just start tattooing. Really, it's, it's, that's all it really takes. So the, so the, 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 tat, <laughs> the choice of the tattooing is made at the, at the same, at the same time that the tattooing is done or is it done prior prior to the appointment prior well, to the uh, actual date well uh me with uh, with the current um new technology i have an ipad i can set up a design literally in minutes but usually i i already have a set plan and a set idea to to come in because that's that's what the whole consultation and deposit it's all about All set, for Mr. Bennett. If, if, if I could just add to that, uh, to get into the building, there's full-time security. There are cameras inside and out. There's a full-time security person on site. They have to be cleared into the building before they can even go up to his studio. And could you give us your name, please? Stephen Torrey. Steve Torrey. Yep. Okay, very good. Uh, a question of the petitioner. You are highly regulated by the uh, Board of Health, correct? Yes. And you will be renting from Mr. Tory. Yes. Most likely, if things don't work out, he's going to ask you to leave. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm just saying that's the control that the owner has of the building. Correct. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, very good. Well, also, once again, we run a security check and a background check on anybody we rent to. And they are fully responsible for anybody that they allow to come to the building. We hold them responsible and we have asked people to leave after short terms. But for the most part, we've been very successful. We're careful about who we rent to and we're, we're on site ourselves. So we manage the property and control. Uh, Steve, I, have, Steve, I have a question. Ms. Smith. Um, are you regulated uh, by new state guidelines for PPE? And have you considered the cost of running your business with the current um, guidelines for safety? Well, yeah, right now we're, we're currently, um, I'm only doing like one customer a day to, um, to give me the time to clean up and stuff and, and, and keep everything sanitized. But I mean, other than that, like, um, yeah, I check, yeah, I check the temperature before they come in the door. I, I, I air purifier in the room. I wear masks, they wear masks. Um, gloves, obviously the standard. Um, so it, it's like, People before they come in, they, they're going to know that they're safe because uh, all precautions are, are covered. Thank you. We, we, also, we also require masks to enter the building. There are sanitizing stations on both sides of the entrance. And each person who rents from us is required to fill out the mandatory plan. Uh, it has to be kept on file. They, technically, they don't have to give a copy of that to me, but I do take a copy and keep it in my files. So they have to have a plan for their own space. Okay, very good. Any other member? No questions? Good. I'm going to close. I, I'm sorry, somebody saying something? Uh, no, no, sorry about that. Well, good, okay. I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. I'm going to open up for public discussion. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor?
Chair, I see no one in, wants to speak in favor. I'll close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here who wants to speak in opposition? Chair, I see no one. And nobody's presented to speak in opposition. I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there any public official that wants to speak on the issue? Chair, I see no public officials. No public officials. I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. I'm now going to open the hearing for deliberation by the board. The board members. I will just mention that this is a unique situation where this years ago used to be the Stacy Adams shoe factory and it was in disrepair and Mr. Tory took this building and did an outstanding job refurbishing it and putting these small businesses in the building. It's unfortunate it sits in a residential area so when certain businesses want to go in there they got to end up coming before us. That's the reason that he's here tonight. Um, uh, just as they mentioned to the board, we can we can put a stipulation on the variance that it's time sensitive. In other words, we could say that this variance could be granted for a period of a year or two years. It goes with the property, but it does not go with the, uh, the, the business. So if he walks out and leaves, um, it has a sunset clause to it. Or we can just grant it. It's whatever the board wants to do. I would certainly agree with that. Uh... Uh, stipulation. Can I, time am I heard? What would the board be looking at for a time? Two years? Mr. Bernard? Uh, I think two years, renewable every two years um, uh, makes sense. We, <laughs> this is the first venture for this young, for this, uh, for this young man. No, not a guarantee that it's going, going to work. Um, and uh, I think two years is, re is reasonable. Uh, would that mean, would, would, just for clarification, uh, uh, the Chief, would that mean they have to come back to us to extend the uh, special permit? Yes. So I guess the board would either grant the variance that would stay there in perpetuity with the property, or is it something the board wants to control in future years? So it, it, we can go either way on this thing. Where, uh, where, where, where uh, is it a residential zone? I mean, it's a unique building, but it is in a res residential zone. I wouldn't want to set a precedent where, would, <laughs> where we would uh, uh, be giving a variance for, for a use that's not accepted in a residential zone for this um, uh, property uh, because it is unique. So the special permit with the time frame seems to make more sense to me. So your suggestion is put a two-year limit on it? Yes. Very good. What's the regular part of the board? Okay with that? I just think it should sunset upon this petitioner either closing down or leaving the building. We shouldn't make him come before us every two years. If his business is in business for 10 years, it should sunset upon the closure of the business. That's my opinion. The problem is we can't make it with his continued ownership. What we have to look at is if the business closes down, that's what we got to base it on. I mean, we can just grant it and get it over with. Yeah, no, I don't think it's fair. We should make him come back every two years. All right, you you all right with that, Mr. Bernard? I, I couldn't quite hear uh, uh, Chief Williams. So what would the you suggestion is we just grant the variance as it stands. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I I lean towards uh, 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 granting granting this petition. I don't want to restrict. I'm just trying to be reasonable. To be reasonable. All right, sure, I'll go along with that. Very good. All right, anybody want to make a motion? Motion to grant. Somebody I'll second that? I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded to grant. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bernard. Yes. Ms. Smith. Yes. Mr. Lanus. Yes. Chief Williams. Yes. 
Chairman Galligan. Yes. Mr. Chair, we have a five in favor and zero opposed. Okay, the vote is five in favor, no opposition. The petition is granted. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, we got Let Street. Anybody here for that? See anybody? Um, Mr. Warren, are you ready to present yourself? Indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Attorney Chairman Warren. Uh, on behalf of the owner of Pearly G Investments. Hold, hold on just a minute. Just a minute. Does the petitioner want to continue or to wish to withdraw? Continue, please. Okay. The next petition before us tonight is petition 2047, the petition of Matthew Dupec, 130 Liberty Street, Suite 110, Brockton, Mass., for a variance, seeking permission to keep a three family dwelling in the zone located one LF. Good evening. Uh, Attorney Brown Warren, on, on behalf of the petitioner, and, and I would like to correct, there was a typographical error with the petition when it was originally submitted uh, on that. And it should have been submitted on behalf of Pearly G Investments, who is actually uh, Pearly G Investments LLC, who is the owner, uh, Ms. Francesca Alves Hines, who is with me tonight, uh, is the owner of that LLC. Uh, and we tried to get that changed around the time the coronavirus uh, reared its ugly head. And uh, it, it looks like it, is, it has survived these many months. Uh, and, so and what is the actual name then? What's the new name? It, it is Pearly, P-E-R-L-I-E, -E, space G, the letter G like Gordon, Investments, LLC is the actual owner of the property. Okay. There was a typo. It was a, it was a big one, too. That other name was supposed to be Attorney Ezepak with an E, not a D. So it was, uh, it was a good one all the way around. Okay. All right, so proceed. So I, this property, uh, we're coming in a little late to the game here, but I, I believe it's been uh, a troubled property for probably the last uh, year and a half or so. Uh, my understanding is uh, the prior owner of this was a, uh, an Alves uh, Construction Inc. And that sometime in 2018, he started work on this property. I suspect he started it without pulling proper permits. Uh, although I haven't pulled the jacket to, to find that out. Um, at some point, there was, uh, he was notified by the building department. It appears I have plans that have been submitted um, to, to the board that show they were working on revising what he was doing back in uh, June of, of 2018. Apparently, uh, Mr. Alves died in uh, October, sometime in the fall of, of 2018. Uh, at which point the project that he was working on uh, came to a, a stop while uh, his affairs tried to uh, be settled. And I think ultimately um, the house fell to foreclosure because nobody they couldn't move fast enough and uh, finish the project, which comes into uh, the current owner who bought the home uh, from a foreclosure auction in August of 2019. Um, at that point, I've, I've, I've seen notices here from the city of, in May of 2019 that there was concerns over the state of the project at that point. Uh, and then uh, when the South Hines went to uh, restart the project, get it finished, restore the home to its current, uh, its, its former uh, condition, 
Uh, she was denied a permit, I think, because of the concerns over it being open uh, for that long. And the city uh, was obviously concerned about blighted property and, and making sure that it was safe at that point. So she was denied a permit, which leads us to this point. And I guess we're appealing that that decision that uh, that she should not be able to continue to rehab the property to its former uh, condition. I, did. Uh, I would only say I, I believe that uh, some of the grounds and, and again if there's uh, if there's any information on the other side of this it would be helpful because we don't have the full picture here but um, my understanding is that there was questions about this being a uh, uh, non-conforming use a, a three-family in a c2 zone uh, and that was what the original denial was on was that right. it sits in a c2 zone and it's been abandoned to the point where it's lost its, its status. So that's Correct. why you are looking for a variance to reestablish that as a residence. Yes, and, and, and I would only, I guess I would argue that I don't think it has, uh, it's, it's been abandoned or uh, lost its usage. I, I went back and looked this, uh, at least from Google Earth, from what I can see when, when this, the, uh, the prior gentleman, Mr. Alves, was shut down, um, the, it looks like the envelope of the building was was completely intact as of April of 2018. You can see the roof is clearly on, everything's intact. Um, I think his fault was uh, probably not going and pulling permits the way he should have done it in the first place uh, for the repairs that he was doing to the property. But it is a property that to this day is still classed by the city as a three family. I believe it's always been a three family. Uh, it keeps in character the rest of Home Street and, and the let that has uh, numerous three family properties here. Uh, so we would, uh, we would ask for, I guess, a variance to, to continue or, or to really uh, allow it to continue. We don't think it ever stopped being one. We just think there was a, a slight pause, um, but it's, it's always been a three family. Okay, just to clarify things, we believe it's a two family. Uh, the lot that it sits on is under size and the building as it currently stands is a very dangerous building. I can, you know? I can tell you the current owner is, uh, is anxious and has been anxious for a while. Obviously the, the virus here has slowed us down somewhat uh, in, in getting things done uh, as fast as we'd hoped to, but she's very anxious to bring this building back up to code and get it good. Um, you know, I, I would only, to, to the point of it being a two family, um, I pulled the assessor's database information even tonight and uh, it, it still has it classed as a three family. It, it says it's a style, the tax, it's taxed as a three family sloping roof property. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, it's always been that way, or at least for quite some time. Can you demonstrate to the board what the hardship is with this particular location? It, indeed. Uh, the owner purchased this property in, in uh, August of 2019 uh, at a, a, a substantial price with the expectation, the understanding this was a three family, had been a three family. She could continue, finish the project, get it back up to uh, code, uh, had presented plans that to make the building really nice, fit in with the rest of the, the neighborhood uh, and provide a great, a great space um, for, for several families. So um, to deny the, the three family status of this would, uh, would be a true burden. It, it would really devalue the property to the point where there'd be a excessive loss on, on the investment. And this is a property that uh, she intends to hold on to. This is, this is not a, a flip and get out of town. This, this is a, uh, a hold property. Uh, so it really would be an important thing to, to hold on to and make work financially. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the board? I'll close that portion of the hearing. I'll open it up for public discussion. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? No documents come in. Negative. 
Okay, so there's nobody speaking in favor. I'm gonna close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? In no document. Okay, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. There's nobody speaking in opposition. Is there any public officials that want to speak on the issue? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. I will now open it up for deliberations from the board. Members of the board. All right, I'll start off the deliberations. Uh, this building is in deplorable condition as it exists right now. In fact, it is a severe fire hazard to that neighborhood. Uh, the plan that has been submitted to us actually encroaches on the outside of the current footprint of the dwelling. They want to add another stairway in the rear on the south side of the building in order to get a full stairway to go to the top floor. The two and a half story wood frame on the top is proposed to square up the walls and it would look more like a three story flat rather than a two and a half with a slanted roof. The parking plan that they have shown is to me unacceptable. Uh, with the cars stacked in the driveway, with the cars parked directly up against the property line and the house, there's only less than eight feet of room to pass between car number one and car number two. And then there are more cars parked off of Home Street, which is car number five and number six. There is virtually no green space with this place at all. Every square inch of this yard is going to be used for driveway. So keeping that in mind, uh, I understand that she has a, a, a monetary investment in this building. And the, the lot is such that when the building became abandoned, this lot became unbuildable. There's only 4,335 square feet and it needs a uh, two family, 10,000. And if it's gonna be a three family, it needs 12,000. So it's greatly undersized on square footage. I would be leaning towards re rebuilding this house without an occupied top floor. In other words, if this was a two family house with four off street parking locations, I think it would make more sense than what we're seeing here. This is building out every square inch of this piece of property. It's a very congested neighborhood, and I'm sure we're gonna see cars parked on both streets. Uh, there's gonna be on-street parking that goes on now. This is just gonna exacerbate the situation. So my thought is if this house was rebuilt on the existing foundation as a two-family, uh, I would not have an objection to that. Now, whether a house could be built on the existing stone foundation, I guess an engineer would have to determine that. But if this current foundation could not support it, yes. uh, they could request to put a poured foundation in the exact same spot that the current foundation is in. So I just, I'm just expressing my concern that this is a very, very large house on a postage stamp lot that is not going to enhance that neighborhood. If there was nothing built here, this piece of property would become an ice store. It would not be uh, good for the neighborhood. I think it makes more sense to put a house there, but I think there's just too much house that is trying to be put on this little tiny lot. So that's my thought. If it was two family, I think it would work. Three family, it is way too much. And the parking is such that there is absolutely no green space and there is not enough room between car one and two for anybody to pass through there. So that's my thoughts on the thing. So to end my thought, I guess what I would say, I, I would, I'm going tonight to vote to deny this 
because of how big it's proposed to be, but I would not be opposed to them coming back with a different plan with a two family house with something a little bit better than what they proposed tonight. I, I think, yep, I, I think the uh, the owner, and, I, and again, you can speak for yourself, I think is, is definitely trying to make this work for the neighborhood as well. Uh, I, I think that's definitely a goal. I'll let you speak to it if you'd like to. Uh, my name is Francesca Alps Hines. Yes, good um, evening. Good evening, owner of Pearly G Investments. Uh, the property as it currently stands as a three family, although it is in disrepair, I understand that at this time, I am working to bring it back to its previous uh, wonder, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of the square footage done, right? that would be added would be to the third floor level, just kind of making sure that um, it's a comfortable space for the tenants. Uh, we are going to, you know, install sprinklers so that it is, you know, safe in terms of, I know you had mentioned that you were concerned um, that it may, you know, be a fire hazard. So we are looking to make sure that we have a sprinkler system. Uh, the parking plans that are currently there uh, it calls for a few of the cars to park on the side where the driveway is, and then also on the other side of the house. But we are going to have green space in the front, and we'll also have green space on the side. I plan on landscaping it and also uh, hydro seeding the grass and the lawn. So um, my intention is also to keep the fence. There's one existing fence. I would just like to put a newer version of it, but I think I could definitely make this no longer an eyesore to the neighborhood. And it would also create some much needed housing for tenants. Um, most of the houses in that neighborhood currently, especially on that side of the street, are three families. So I think it would conform to the neighborhood and it would actually add value to the houses around it. But if it was, converted to a two-family, uh, it would be a significant loss to Pearly G Investments, especially as a holding. Uh, and it, I think it would just be a loss to the city. You know, you lose one residential dwelling, that'd be one less person with a home. Very good, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Motion to grant hopes it does not prevail. Second. We have a motion to grant, and the motion has been seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bernard. No. Ms. Smith. No. Mr. Lanis. No. Chief Williams. No. Chairman Galligan. No. Mr. Chair, that's a um, zero in favor, five against. Taking the vote is zero in favor, five opposed. The variance is denied. Is that the last? At this point, I will close the hearing. I will close the hearing.